Well, according to a new report, financial abuse is costing Australians $5.2 billion every year. That's $2.1 billion more than the amount we lose to scams. Financial abuse happens when someone takes away your access to funds, controls or manipulates financial decisions, prevents you from earning money or uses your cash without your consent. But hopefully the tides are turning as a new campaign launches, raising awareness about the red flags, the sort of things you've really got to keep an eye out for. So if you're concerned someone you know is at risk, remember to talk. T is for trust your instincts. A is for ask openly and gently. L is for listen actively. K is for know the support available. For more, we bring in Seven Finance expert Gemma Acton. Hi, Gemma. Hi, uh, the stats around financial abuse, these are really alarming numbers now. They are. What's also alarming is how hard it can be to tell if somebody is undergoing financial abuse. The person themselves might not even realise. They might just think, oh, this person looks out for me, looks after me. They don't want me to work because they want me to relax. They uh, look after my money because they think I might find it too complicated. But ultimately, if you don't know how much money you have or how many funds you have, if you can't access them when you want to, if you want to work and you can't, you've lost a lot of independence, particularly mm. if you ever want to make a major life decision or, or leave a situation that's really difficult to... So, so what the advice is to do what? Well, the advice is to be aware yourself if you're under any of those conditions, but also look out for your friends. Like, if anyone says anything that might raise an alarm bell for you, as that video just said, just ask gentle probing questions. Right. You know, see how much control someone might have. OK. Um, lots in the news in the last couple of days about these crackdown on credit card surcharges. What does this mean for everybody? Well, hopefully it means we'll ultimately be paying a bit less in credit card surcharges because mm. last year we paid around $1 billion, yeah, wow. uh, which is a lot. And people are getting very frustrated every time they, they buy a coffee or anything else. That that, that's, the that's the so tap that, charge. That's the tap charge. They do it on debit as well, don't they? They do. Yes. And that's the point, Kylie. So what we're looking at now is the government said it's not averse to ban uh, that surcharge on debit cards. Mm -hmm. They'll um, probably keep it on credit cards. Uh, cash already, you don't obviously pay anything. But the Reserve Bank and the Consumer Watchdog, the ACCC, are both now tasked with looking and understanding what exactly is going on. So at a minimum, there'll be more transparency and hopefully debit cards won't have that charge going forward. Mm, that, that, that would be a fair and just uh, outcome. Would be helpful. Uh, cash was king, then it wasn't. Apparently, it's making a comeback. Really? Uh, <laughs> I, that, that, that's probably a, a very optimistic mystic mm. read of the situation. So last month, the number of ATM transactions went up, but that was a bit of a blip. Uh, if we look at what's happening longer term, we see during COVID, when everyone was terrified of touching money, mm. uh, obviously cash transactions fell quite dramatically. It's since levelled off, but that's at around 6%. So 6% of transactions today are done in Australia using cash. So a really small amount, especially when you compare it back to 2007, which really wasn't that long ago. It was around 66% of transactions used cash. So We've certainly um, come a long way in those 17 years. And I think globally, we're, we're right up there with a cashless, we are. aren't we? Like we are. in other parts of the world. We it's love not our digital that wallets. High. We yeah. love our digital wallets, yes. Yeah. I was in a coffee shop, I was telling you, on Sunday morning, uh, walking the dog, and, and everyone's in there lined up for their coffees and their croissants, and the guy announced, he said, oh, my machine's down, cash only, everybody. 20 people just turn around and walked out. No one's got, no one's got cash anymore. Mm. I certainly don't carry any on me. I, I don't. feel yeah. very weird. All right, let's move on. Just over half the population are in a private health fund and providers are preparing to ask the Albanese government to uh, hike up premiums. Oh. This is not what we want to hear right now. Yes. What are you about to say, Kylie? Uh, what? <laughs> exactly. like, how much higher can they go? Well, they go up every April and it's around this time of year in about two weeks' time that we find out how much they're going to go up by the, the following April. Uh, this year is around 3%. The fear is that is going to be quite a lot more than that this year, around 5 to 6%, which, you know, several years into a cost of living crisis is really bad news for people and not great news either for the government just ahead of uh, next year's mm. election either. So I will wait and see in a couple of weeks' time where that ends up. Mm. On to rental reforms now. Are there maybe some good news around the corner for tenants? In New South Wales, yes. Uh, so obviously it's been a landlord's market for a long time. Renters have just been having to take whatever deal they can get in many cases. But we're introducing um, new laws in New South Wales, which means, firstly, it'll be easier to bring pets in to live with you. Um, secondly, landlords will only be able to increase rent once a year, maximum. 
Um, and thirdly, an end to no grounds eviction. So if you haven't done anything wrong, they can't just toss mm. you out because they want to increase the rent on a new tenant. All right, there's this new report out uh, highlighting how many Australians are doing it really tough and even tr struggling to get food on the table at the moment. Yeah, it's terrible, Larry. Like, over the last few years, again, during the cost of living crisis, the uh, number of Australians who are food insecure, which means you can't necessarily um, pay for three meals a day or afford them, um, has kept going up and up and up. And yeah. That's obviously caused a tremendous strain on food charities, also because uh, families and friends of people who are food insecure are finding it harder to support them. We saw a lot in the last few years of family and friends stepping in to provide mm. meals where possible, and probably because the cost of living crisis is catching up with more and more people, um, we're seeing less of that these days. So a really difficult situation for low-income families, single-parent families are particularly exposed, uh, so a, a really difficult time for, for many people. Tough numbers, okay. yeah. Okay, Gemma, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Up to date on all things finance.